Hello, welcome to the Wednesday, November 8th, 2017 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Miami, Florida. Xavier came across a fairly convoluted and interesting infection vector that he saw being used in some spam that he caught in his spam trap. It all starts out as so often with an RTF document. That document then downloads a URL that includes an XML document. The, the XML document then uses the Microsoft HTML application host in order to grab another URL that includes an obfuscated VBA script. Now, this Visual Basic for application script is where it gets a sort of interesting. It first kills all word instances and then checks which was the last word document opened, which of course should be the original RTF document. Now it uses that RTF document to extract a form that's then being displayed in Word. So Word is restarted, kind of pretending like nothing happened. And then an executable that was added at the end of the document is executed. DDA also saw a second Visual Basic script being downloaded, but that script was never executed. So not really clear what it's for. Maybe the malware wasn't quite done yet. Now, from a defensive point of view, uh, these documents are actually pretty easy to spot because uh, the Windows binary is essentially just appended to the end of the document. You will see that string, this program cannot be run in DOS mode within the file. So simple rule here. If an RTF document that claims to be a Word document does include this string, this program cannot be run in DOS mode. It's probably malicious. And the initial download is accomplished with the include picture feature. Again, that string include picture is in the clear, easy to detect. And if you're listening to this podcast, you probably know enough about security to not just plug untrusted USB sticks into your computer. Typically, we're really more afraid here about malware that may either automatically or accidentally be executed when we plug in this USB stick. But it turns out in particular, if you're using Linux, there are actually a large number of unpatched vulnerabilities in the USB subsystem for Linux. So these are all the different drivers that are used to read data across USB and also deal with USB file systems. Andrei Konovalov just posted 79 new and so far unpatched flaws to a mailing list and also to his GitHub repository. Now, most of these vulnerabilities are labeled as a denial of service vulnerability. And you may say, hey, I'm not really all that excited about someone who is able to plug a USB stick into my computer to actually launch a denial of service on the computer, meaning crashing the computer. But this is really just the initial assessment of these vulnerabilities. It's very possible that some of these vulnerabilities can lead to code execution. So continue to be careful and this does not just affect these USB memory sticks, even though they're usually the easiest to manipulate, but these bugs really affect more or less any USB device, even though some of them are sort of file system specific, but then again, anything you plug into your USB port may be able to emulate whatever USB device you are vulnerable to. And Google released the November update for Android. Probably the most noteworthy patch here is a patch for the crack vulnerability. 
but in my opinion, more dangerous and more likely to be exploited are the vulnerabilities in the media framework. There are five critical vulnerabilities that can lead to remote code execution. This update also addresses three different remote code execution vulnerabilities in the Qualcomm chipset that could be used to attack and affect a device via its Wi-Fi interface. And then we have another cryptocurrency news item. Ethereum is in the news again, and yet again, it's about multi-signature wallets. One thing that's sort of special about Ethereum is that a wallet can really include code with fairly complex rules how particular currency transactions are being performed. Now, this has caused, of course, problems in the past. This latest issue affects yet again multi-signature wallets. For these transactions, multiple users have to agree to perform a certain transaction. Now, this is a quite useful concept. You have it often in businesses where multiple individuals have to sign off on a particular payment. But the problem here was that due to a buggy implementation, a user accidentally locked a large number of these wallets. So they are now no longer accessible looks like $280 million of Ethereum currency is lost as part of this. Wallets created after July 20th are affected and this is when the patch for the prior issue was rolled out, but apparently it didn't fix all of the problems with these particular multi-signature contracts. Well, and that's it for today. So thanks for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.